So, so it's a very it's a great pleasure to introduce Shuddha Sattva Brahma today, who is uh, uh, and welcome to today's seminar. So he has really is a he has he's, he's a he has more than fifty papers, I think, and he's pretty di di worked on very diverse areas of cosmology, from loop quantum cosmology to high end string theory with Keshav Dasgupta and anything where he has shown with a desitor, he's worked on how desitor could be a part of string theory. So today I think his uh, talk would be somewhat stringy related to Swampland uh, uh, conjectures of string theory and how it constrains early universe cosmology. So over to you, we are uh, very ex excited about your talk, uh, over to you. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, thanks a lot for this kind invitation. And yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk today about hints for UV completion of the early universe. And the idea is to give you sort of an overview of what I have been thinking about over the last few years. So of course, I won't cover everything in all these papers, but I just want to make sure that I, uh, I, I give credit to all my collaborators. Uh, I'll mostly focus on the papers in red. Uh, including one which came out very recently, a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> by myself, but also, yes, I'll also take elements from the other papers as well. Okay, so what, what am I interested in is, is the very early, you know, part of the universe when uh, we uh, write about here, uh, how did, where did we come from, and so on. So this is, of course, very exciting for any, any cosmologist, any theoretical physicist, in, indeed. And of course, we know that there is an answer to this question. Uh, uh, there's a very widespread, uh, well-known um, paradigm of inflation, which tells us that you know we had an epoch of accelerated expansion in the very early universe. And this, this has been remarkable in not only just solving standard cosmological puzzles, but also explaining uh, observations such as that of late time inhomogeneities which we can measure in the CMB or you know, the structure in our universe. So in this sense, uh, inflation is remarkably uh, successful and it explains all of these late time inhomogeneities as originating from quantum vacuum fluctuations. However, we don't know everything about inflation. So just to emphasize on this point, uh, I, would, I would want to point out that we don't even know what, at what, which scale inflation took place. And there's a wide range over which inflation could have taken place. The bounds here, uh, the, the upper bound comes from the fact that we haven't observed primordial tensor, mo uh, ten tensor modes yet, primordial gravitational waves yet. And the lower bound is from BBN constraints. So of course, naturally, if we are interested in the very early universe, we have to answer the question, what came before inflation? And since we do not even know when inflation at which scale inflation took place, uh, this is a really difficult question to answer. And this is just another cartoon to tell you that, you know, in classical general relativity, we know inflation does not solve the singularity problem, for instance. And we expect that, you know, space time on very uh, microscopic scale, on Planck scales would become, uh, would be something completely different. It wouldn't be smooth continuum that we are used to in classical physics. So the natural question is, if uh, if, it, if inflation cannot by itself solve the singularity problem, is there some UV completion possible for inflation? I, to put it differently, can I derive inflation from some more fundamental physics, some more fundamental theory like, um, like string theory, for instance? And what is nice here is that we have precision observations to guide us. So, you know, cosmology has really come a long way as, as shown by this cartoon. So we have really measured very well how the temperature uh, varies from point to point in the sky. And we can use these things to constrain whatever quantum gravity theory we have in mind. So that's very exciting in principle that we can use observations uh, to, to test predictions of quantum gravity. Uh, but there are different ways of going about this. And I just want to, at the very beginning, kind of tell you my philosophy about this. So one way is to look at simplified toy models, which are inspired somehow by quantum gravity. And a classic example of this is loop quantum cosmology. So loop quantum cosmology by no means is derived from loop quantum gravity, but it has the same quantization uh, ideas, let's say, that one uses in loop quantum gravity. So it takes a much simpler cosmological system and quantizes that system 
uh, using some rules which which would be which is what one would expect from loop quantum gravity. So that why do we do that is because of course we can't start with the full loop quantum gravity theory and derive loop quantum cosmology. That's no one knows how to do that. So that's one way to go about it. So then you uh, then you work with these simplified toy models and you try to derive some predictions for these models for our universe from these models for our universe. The other philosophy about this is to say that no, we won't look at some very simplified toy model. Instead, what we would do is derive some mathematical consistency conditions. So, for example, again, uh, a prime example, of course, of this is the Sloan plan, which is to say we would identify some universal features of quantum gravity, and we would expect that whatever be the low energy effective field theory which describes you know, inflation or, or whatever early universe cosmology we have in mind, should certainly satisfy these consistency conditions. So this is uh, this is the philosophy that I have uh, come to adopt uh, over time. Although I, as as mentioned by you, I did my PhD in loop quantum gravity, but I've kind of drifted apart from that. And the idea here is that not so much to say that let's look at a particular model and then try to use some quantum corrections or whatever, but rather to say what are some general principles we can derive which any early universe cosmology must satisfy in order to be a consistent theory. Hi, and, can you indicate yeah. uh, when you mean consistency yeah. conditions, uh, what you have in mind? Yeah, that's that's pretty much going to be the talk. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of set up different consistency conditions, not just from string theory, but also let's say loop quantum gravity, what I have in mind. I, I will, I mean, that's going to be the talk pretty much. This is just very vague right now. Okay. Uh, j j if you if you want an explicit example, for instance, uh, there are certain uh, consistent conditions, such as you know, if you use a, some quantization procedure like one does in loop quantum gravity, it's important to go back and check if your quantization procedure breaks symmetries, because in this case we're talking of gauge symmetries. So that's a consistency condition that no matter what kind of quantum corrections you put in from your quantum gravity theory, namely loop quantum gravity in this case, that should not give rise to some gauge anomalies. And that in, in particular rules out certain models of loop quantum cosmology. So that's just an example. Thank you. Okay, so yes, yeah, so I've already mentioned this and this is quite ambitious of course, but also very promising in the sense that if successful, this would set up a new standard model of cosmology because we would have an early universe phase, which is really consistent. Okay, so let's focus on the swamp plan to begin with, but uh, the idea here is going to be that I, I'm going to, for the most part of the talk, focus on uh, statements from string theory and try to use those as consistency conditions. But then at the very end, uh, perhaps in the last few minutes, I'll talk of uh, other approaches such as the hartle hawking wave function or loop quantum gravity and how those also have certain cons consistency conditions which must be satisfied. So in this sense, I really view the swamp land as a much bigger uh, pr uh, you know, principle, uh, not something that is tied to uh, string theory. However, the way that the swamp land is defined would more or less be the same, that you, know, you have some low energy effective field theory, which by itself does not seem to have any problem. So you know, I can obviously write down a low energy effective field theory, which violates Lorentz invariance or some, some crazy thing like this. And that's, that's bad. And that we can throw away anyway. So the, the, but that, that's not you know, part of the swamp land because those we, can, we know are not good theories to begin with. Instead, we look at low energy effective field theories, which, are, which look perfectly healthy, which look perfectly okay. But then the swampland conditions are going to be such that they would tell you that although from the low energy point of view, this theory looks to be perfectly fine, they cannot be completed into quantum gravity in the UV. So that's, that's going to be the, again, the broad principle here. So for all the conditions that I will mention, taking mass Planck to infinity would, would render them uh, trivial. So there can be other consistency conditions for the effective field theories, of course, but those are not the ones that I'm interested in for the purposes of this talk. Okay, so of course, as many of you perhaps know, this is a complement to the string landscape. The idea is that you know there's, there can be a very large landscape of string theory, um, but but then the swamp land is even larger. So there's so in other words, there can be a lot of low energy effective field theories which can come from string theory, but there are a lot more which definitely do not. So there are a lot of effective field theories which cannot have any UV completion. 
so, so you mean uh, again when you mean you know UV completion, you mean UV completion with gravity, right? That is what you mean. That's right. That's right. Yes, yes. I'm I'm always yeah. in this. Yeah, for all my conditions, I mass goes to infinity. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So how do I how do I ensure this? So the uh, as as will become more apparent during the talk, um, the problem with the swampland right now is that it's much more conjectural than one would um, want it to be. So we, there are a lot of conjectures which which if you believe them. So this must is not to say that you know you should believe this conjecture. This must is to say that if you believe the conjectures, then they must be satisfied to avoid the swampland. So I, I'll just list a few. For example, the weak gravity conjecture, the distance conjecture, or the De Sitter conjecture. And I, for this per talk again, I'm going to mostly focus on the De Sitter conjecture, which tells us that for any low energy effective field theory which involves a scalar field. Uh, the potential of the scalar field must obey certain con constraints. For instance, its slope cannot be very small. So for, in particular, this C is a positive number. It rules out C equals zero. So you, you, uh, you don't have De Sitter, or at least metastable De Sitter. You can have some unstable uh, turning points, but those have tachyonic instabilities. So of course, a legitimate question at this point is where are these coming from? And that, that is something that I will um, address later on. But the idea is somewhat that, you know, there are all these conjectures which must be satisfied for a theory to be healthy, for a low energy effective field theory to have some UV completion. So in principle, this is again very powerful because now there is some quantum gravity reason, which I haven't told you, of course, but there's some quantum gravity reason for which in your low energy effective field theory, you should not trust any theory which allows for, let's say, V prime equals zero. Uh, so, you know, the sitter is ruled out or, or uh, allows for some field excursions, which are more than order one in Planck units. All of this is in Planck units. So this is very powerful. And somehow this kind of reminds me of the early days of quantum mechanics that there are all these, you know, there are sort of these quantization rules. We don't quite know what the structure, the mathematical structure behind the swamp land is, but some of, so some of these rules would turn out to be not quite correct. Some of them would turn out to have some uh, truth to them, but we, we don't know the situation, but it's very exciting nevertheless, because this is a new proposal to constrain low energy effective field theories. And those are the ones which are interesting, of course, for phenomenology. Okay, so as a cosmologist, which is how uh, I look at myself and which is how I'm gonna present the talk, uh, why do we, uh, I mean, why should we believe in the swamp? And I mean, what, what, to begin with, why do we want quasi city space? And I believe all of you know this, that uh, there's an overwhelming evidence uh, uh, from data that uh, there were at least two stages of accelerated expansion in the cosmic history. And the first one is what I'll mostly focus on for the purpose of this talk, which is the inflationary era. And you know the reason why we like inflation as cosmologists, of course, is that it's the simplest solution to explain, as I as I said, the um, the large scale inhomogeneities which we observe. So this is very simple idea that if you have if you accept the existence of this quasi de Sitter space, then inflation fits data, and we are done. So you know, as cosmologists, that's good enough. We write down some theory. It uh, you know it, it it explains all the observations. We, we should be happy. So why is quantum gravity completion of inflation important? Like if I'm a cosmologist, why should I even bother about that? Even if there are some conditions, why, why is that so important for me? Well, that's because inflation, as I mentioned, by itself does not explain everything. For example, we don't know what is the origin of the inflation field. We expect some fundamental theory to um, explain that to us, as well as we don't know what are the initial conditions which can lead to inflation. And what I mean here by initial conditions is it can be best illustrated by something like this kind of a cartoon that you know people always say that you know inflation on rolls down some almost flat potential so this is a slow roll inflation that i'm referring to of course but i mean why should the field be displaced over here why should it not be at its minima why should it even start here why should it start out anywhere like this so these are things which we expect a quantum gravity theory to explain we expect that there is going to be some explanation from quantum gravity, which will tell us why we begin with uh, such a phase, to, uh, why, we, why we were in such a phase to begin with. So Shuddha, this is and, probably related to one yes. of your other works where you are claiming that uh, in reality, it should be some sort of an excited coherent state uh, uh, that should describe. Uh, that's, that's correct, that's correct, yes. Um, so in, within string theory, the, the, the idea is that if you, were, if you were to have it, it should be some sort of coherence. That's right, I, I'll, I'll try to touch over that if I, if I have time, that's right. I'm sorry, you're referring uh, to the state of the background field? 
That's right. The, the state of the background field. I, I mean, the point in the, for this coherent state when I when I get to it would be that you know there is no fundamentally classical de Sitter or quasi de Sitter space. So fundamentally, space is uh, Minkowski, and then we choose a coherent state which describes. I mean, the, when you take expectation values of of operators about this coherent state that describes um, a metric which looks like Sitter. So Sitter is not something which is fundamental, but I mean classical, but it is. it can be only described using a coherent state picture. Does that answer the question? Yes, and uh, I mean, uh, there is also a lot of interest in examining whether you know, if there are inhomogeneities, whether inflation can start and so on. Uh, somewhere those right. also need to be accounted for. That's correct, that's correct. Yeah, that's, that's precisely my point that, I mean, um, in some sense, the quantum gravity, I mean, we must not forget that there was a quantum gravity. I mean, as inflationary cosmologists, we must not just write down some potential and say that, you know, this explains data, I'm done. Because as you mentioned that, uh, well, where, where does this potential come from? Why should the field be there? And so on. These are important questions, which only some fundamental theory will answer. Explain inflation by itself cannot explain its initial conditions. Thank you. So if we, yeah. So if we let's say now, for, for now, let's just believe in. So the idea is that you can't have it both ways. So if you want quantum gravity to explain these initial conditions, then you must also have quantum gravity. Uh, you, you must also accept the conditions that quantum gravity tell you as consistency conditions. And if indeed we accept for a second that the decider condition is something uh, to be trusted, then what we know is that you know the v prime over v has had an upper bound as as mentioned here. Sorry. Yeah, as mentioned here. So uh, very beginning, you know, people thought that that means that. Um, you know, not everything goes anymore because the V prime over V is related to the epsilon parameter with the slow roll parameter, and that has an upper bound. So of course, if this C, this order one number is really one, then that rules out inflation because epsilon has to be less than one. Uh, but that's not quite the case. People found out this is, well, order one means it can be 0 0.01 or something. So that's not the real problem. The real problem is that we have an upper bound on the tensor to scalar ratio and using this consistency relation for single field inflation, it, it means that we have an upper bound on epsilon. That, that's perfectly fine, but what's going to happen is that if in the future we do not observe primordial tensor modes, then the upper bound on R is going to reduce. And that would mean we would have to reduce the upper bound on epsilon, and which means that we have to, you know, again, fine tune this order one constant. And that's precisely what one does not want to do uh, for the decider conjecture. You don't want to keep fine tuning this order one number such that such as to fit data all the time. So that's pr pretty much the problem. So inflation, this is just to say that you know, inflation is not automatically ruled out because of the decider conjecture, but there is some tension. But in, in what, what many people realize very soon is that this tension is mostly because of this kind of consistency relation. There's different ways to go past it. One was this non bunch davis state that we chose for um, fluctuations. So we chose an excited state for uh, fluctuations and we showed that that violates this relation so again you can have an order one c and yet r can be small essentially that was what, what we showed but there are other ways to do this of course you can have multi-field inflation models or warm inflation and other things which which all does the same thing that you can have some small uh, so, sorry some large epsilon so to speak large so it's 0.1 or something but then r is still small was there a question yeah, the non bunch Davies vacuum states also will lead to significant back reaction at early times. That's correct. Uh, so you, you have to fine tune the, I mean, the non bunch Davies state such that, um, you know, you, you choose some K cutoff or you choose some exponential of minus K square or lambda square, all these kind of models okay. where the back reaction constraints are always satisfied. So you're not uh, violating one of those. That's right. Okay. And just very quickly, of course, there's also the dark energy era. Again, if you, you know, if you accept the Sitter space, Lambda CDM perfectly fits data. Uh, so, but, but again, if you don't, if you have the Sitter conjecture kind of messes up the story as well. And this, this is actually much worse because you know, Lambda CDM is in definite conflict. I mean, it's certainly ruled out. And even quintessence, it, it was thought earlier on by Vafa himself that, quint that quintessence is the solution. 
but Robert and Lavinian collaborators showed that you know even quintessence uh, is is in a lot of tension because of if this C has to be order one, then quintessence models are in a lot of tension. But cosmologists know a lot of games, and of course we can go beyond quintessence. We can look at some of the Sandusky theories, and a lot of those are actually ruled out also because of the swamp land and data when you combine both these factors. But there are other models like cubic Galilean. Again, I'm, this is, I mean, shameless self-promotion. This is a paper that we wrote about cubic Galilean, but this is not to say that this is the only model which satisfies the swamp land and data. There are many. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> focusing on the one that we worked on. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I won't go into late time cosmology for the purpose of this talk. The main message uh, so to speak, is that, as I mentioned earlier, that this low energy effective field theory, which at least involves accelerating space times, can be constrained by some consistency conditions from quantum gravity. And for again, this 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 uh, rider involving accelerating space times is because I'm mostly focusing on the uh, conjecture to, for today. But there are other things which are also uh, ruled out by the swamp plan. So let's go How to the elephant much, in the room. Uh, uh... I have a brief question. How much does mm -hmm. act, you know, exact D sitter play a role in all these arguments? I mean, you don't actually need exact D sitter. Does that assumption or deviations from it um, change anything? Yeah, it, it changes a little bit, but you see for Lambda CDM, you have an asymptotic D sitter. So that's certainly ruled out, for instance. So when you, when you have to work with, for instance, quintessence, that's fine. But I mean, there are many of these models which have the same fixed points in the future as Lambda CDM. So those fixed points are certainly ruled out. You can never go to uh, asymptotically your decider. So that helps you rule out some of these models. I think my concern was, you know, decider, whether all arguments based on decider symmetries, um, uh, you know, uh, in, in reality, in slow roll inflation, does not possess those same as that's, right. that's correct. That's correct. So for inflation story, the story is you're absolutely right. So for inflation, the story essentially is something like this, that you know, the consistency relation that you have for the tensor to scalar ratio, that gets a bound. And that, I mean that we know it has a bound from observations, and that puts a bound on this uh, upper bound on this order one number. I mean, this is perfectly fine as of now, but like let's say we don't observe tensor modes, then this keeps decreasing. And that's not what you want to do. So yeah, that's actually true that inflation is certainly not ruled out by, by any stretch of imagination right now, at least. I'll come to some conjectures which will try to do that, but as yeah. of now, just for the decision conjecture, that's fine. Um, okay, so let's go to the elephant in the room, which is, but why should you, why should you rule out decider or why should you believe in the decider conjecture and, and what, what is there against it? Well, first of all, the way that people thought about it well, at, at, at least as I understand, was because it was very difficult to construct metastable decider. So that that led to the to the decider conjecture that you know in string theory one couldn't construct this. Uh, one reason is, of course, we know in for decider there's an absence of supersymmetry. That's why you have a lot of ADS solutions. There are various no-go theorems for supergravity, but of course, you know, people knew how to bypass this using some stringy corrections. So for KKLT and LVS, very famously, but many others as well. Uh, but then for even for these, there's a lot of debate, like uh, people are often uh, cite technical obstructions, such as having SUSY breaking fluxes, which was shown by Sabsethi, or having some back reaction of this uplifting uh, mechanism for these anti-brains, as was shown by these people. Th th there are some arguments that they, it leads to some flattening of the potential, or even the starting point having a non-zero, what is known as W0. If you're familiar with this, if you're not, that's fine. The, broad point is that there are some technical obstructions people have uh, pointed out, but I should mention that there's a fierce debate about this. I mean, there are both sides to the story. One, one, one side believes that there are some technical obstructions to all of these models. Some believe, no, that's not true. All of this has been solved. And I can't certainly uh, give you a judgment on this. So I just wanted to point out, it's at least we can agree that it's difficult to construct this here. Whether there are viable solutions or not are very much under, <laughs> under debate. So that's, that's one reason. But of course, what would make us happy is if we could connect this decider conjecture to some other of the swampland conjectures. This would help us also unveil some underlying structure. So you know, this, this is a nice, uh, nice thing I found in one of Tom Rudelius's uh, talks, which was to say that you know, there are so many of these conjectures. But this, this plot is what you should always keep in mind. The ones which are interesting from, for the purposes of phenomenology, like decider conjecture, 
are the least rigorous ones. These are the ones which really people have speculatively conjectured. There's not much support for it, except to say that we don't see the sitter space. Uh, from string theory, it's difficult to construct. Whereas there are a lot which are much more rigorous, such as there are no global symmetries in quantum gravity. But those are not directly very interesting for phenomenology. So what one would want to do, or what would make us happy, is if you could, for example, start with this no global symmetries conjecture, and then derive the De Sitter conjecture from that. That would make the De Sitter conjecture more be, be, be more credible. So that that kind of has also been done. People have derived the asymptotic version of the De Sitter conjecture. So that is to say that the De Sitter conjecture should be satisfied on on the boundaries of moduli space when you know this delta phi goes to infinity. So the, that, that, of course, that's not to say that the Dissider conjecture then should be valued everywhere, but at least people have found some asymptotic version of this is the conjecture, which is derived from the distance conjecture, which is much more rigorously tested again in stringy constructions, plus assuming this covariant entropy bound. And this was done by these people. Uh, there's also the other ideas such as one can derive the Dissider conjecture from uh, the no eternal inflation principle. So if we don't allow eternal inflation, as a, if that is the fundamental principle, then one can have uh, the Dissider conjecture. Uh, this was um, this was shown by Tom Rudelius, but we also found uh, with Sarah Shandera that uh, even earlier than Tom that uh, that perturbative eternal inflation certainly is is uh, is in conflict with the Dissider conjecture. And from uh, various so other can I, can I, yes, can I ask something? Yes, so yes. So, so first about the first question uh, about this uh, asymptotic DS conjecture that still allows for KKLT and stuff like that, right? Because they are right, uh, right. I mean, that's right. It, they are it's not just only asymptotic. Some kind of boundary of the moduli space. Yes. That's right. That's you, right. The flux Absolutely. stabilization is working at. Uh, okay, I see. Yeah. That's okay. Correct. So, uh, that's and then and then uh, this uh, no eternal inflation conjecture, which I thought I, I heard is uh, I heard this saying. So there are many exceptions. Uh, to this like KKLT constructions or something. Uh, I mean, the no right. eternal inflation conjecture apparently allows for those exceptions. That's what I remember from, from a talk of Tom Gudelius. And he was saying that is right. a, actually right. a, a, a better conjecture than the original decimal conjecture. Do you have a comment right. on it? Right. No, I, I totally agree with this. So the point is the no eternal inflation conjecture kind of uh, if you, if you start with, so okay, so the way I, we, with Sarah, what we did was to say that let's start with the De Sitter conjecture, and then let's just try to see if we can have eternal inflation. So eternal inflation requires that you're in this part of parameter space where this P zeta uh, is greater than one, I mean, is, is order one. And the point is, uh, what you find is that these two things are not compatible uh, under, I mean, they, they're not they're not uh, stable under loop corrections. So there's that's why we say that you know perturbatively eternal inflation is ruled out if you accept the Dissider conjecture. So what Tom did was something somehow the opposite. He started with the, that you know let's say that there is no eternal inflation and then solve the Fokker Planck equation and so on and say that I don't want eternal inflation and then they derived uh, you know sort of the all of the, the sorry he derived the Dissider conjecture. So so that's kind of the opposite direction. And you're right. So again, for in inflation, there's a lot of models which are still allowed. It's just that their eternal inflation regime is disallowed. So that's that's how, you know, well, strictly speaking, KKLT is of course de Sitter, but you know, those KKLT MM, I think it's called the, the inflationary version of it is going to be fine with this as far as I know. Yeah, I, I don't know, remember exactly the details, but you're absolutely right that it's, it doesn't rule out everything. Oh. That's correct. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, but then there is what is now known as this TCC. I'll talk a little bit about this later on, so I, I won't go into this now, right now, but then one can start with this and derive the De Sitter conjecture and so on. There's a lot of, lot of things people have worked out. But let's see, let's go beyond the swamp plan now and let's go to more general quantum gravity arguments. So what, what do we have? Well, one thing which we already knew for a very, very long time is that the classical symmetries of De Sitter are inconsistent with having a finite entropy for De Sitter, which is this given sorting entropy. And this was known again for a very long time. So this just to, tells us that the De Sitter space must be meta stable in, by nature. So this doesn't tell us anything about De Sitter conjecture. I'm not claiming something like this. I'm just saying that if you have De Sitter, it should be meta stable. Now that doesn't mean that it has to be very short lived or anything. So KKLT again is perfectly fine with just this statement, but 
it just says that you know classical de Sitter is certainly ruled out. This classical de Sitter is a completely stable solution of Einstein's equations, and it never has to um, it never has to break down. That's not going to be allowed. We, if there is going to be any solution which believes in complementarity or in a finite entropy, essentially, that's going to require that the symmetries break after some time. So they, they must be metastable uh, by nature. And Diwali actually showed that you know you should think of De Sitter in some sense as this is coherent state, and he found a quantum breaking time. So this time this time scale is much smaller than the time scale associated with this argument so this argument tells you that the time scale for de Sitter must be e to the power s s being the entropy of de Sitter. that's a very long time this poincare recurrence time but it is a finite time nevertheless and then diwali said like no no actually the quantum breaking time should be proportional to s so not e to the power s but just s itself the, the entropy of de Sitter. It's a much smaller time, and there are some arguments for that. I won't go into the details of this. But actually, what I do want to point out, and more so if I don't get time at the very end, is that there are actually some indications from other approaches. So Neil Turok and, and Jean-Luc Lenners and Jörg Feldbusch, they pointed out that if one starts with this very famous hartle hawking wave function, it was thought that you know, the background is very nicely comes out of this hartle hawking instant on. And then the perturbations should be in this uh, bunch Davis state. That's what the original work of Hartle Hawking and then later on Hartle and Halliwell showed. But what these guys showed is that if one correctly uses the so-called Picard left shift theory, so that tells you which are the which are the correct saddle points to use, then what one finds is that the background is fine, uh, but I mean it has the opposite probability, but it's fine. Uh, but the perturbations are now inverse Gaussians, so you don't end up with uh, bunch Davis, but you actually end up with some runaway solutions. You start with perturbations, but they're inverse Gaussian, so these are runaway solutions. So really, you cannot have de Sitter uh, coming from hartle hawking wave function. That was the claim of this paper. Again, this is highly debated and you know um, disputed and so on, and they went back and forth with three or four PRLs here, and we thought, uh, why should we not uh, join this uh, party as well? And we wrote a PRL on this to show that, um, well, even if Turok and collaborators are correct and uh, hartle hawking does not lead to de Sitter with some bunch Davis state, uh, you can have some non-perturbative quantum corrections coming from uh, loop quantum gravity, which does allow for that. So, you, so in some sense, some non-perturbative corrections seem to be the way out of this conundrum. And when I would talk about this coherent states, that is again going to be a recurring theme that you need some sort of non-perturbative uh, ideas about de Sitter uh, or quantum corrections to make de Sitter happen in quantum theory, quantum gravity. Uh, Shinpo, uh, isn't Shinpo. this? Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, Shinpo, hi, can I uh, just ask hi. hi, hi. So the, hi. I thought KKLT, I mean, the recent, uh, uh, you know, the no-go theorems, et cetera, are about de Sitter with matter multiplets, right? I mean, the pure de Sitter, in supergravity were already, I think, ruled out in 80s. So the construction KKLT. That's correct. That's correct. But the, now the arguments that you just gave, they are about pure de Sitter. I just wanted to distinguish between the, you know, the no de Sitter in string theory, the recent discussions, and the, the the one that you just pointed out post string theory in the last slide, which are about pure de Sitter, right? Or maybe I misunderstood something. No, no, yeah. So, so as, as I was saying, like, I mean, of course, we know all these no-go theorems, but I mean, they, they can be, I mean, once you allow for like all, all sorts of like, you know, anti-brains and I don't know what not, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this Gajino yeah. conversations and all this, then then it's fine, of course. But my, my point is that um, the idea now is that even those are not fine. There are some technical problem with one or the other. I mean, yes. even let's, yes. let's look at KKLT. Yes, and yes, then people yes. would tell you that, okay, but this back reaction is not okay. Even your starting point of having this yeah. W not equal to not, not equal to zero is not okay and so on. Hmm. Uh, but, but these are very debated. I mean, I, I cannot take sides on this because I'm not no, an I expert. Know. I, I, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I just wanted to distinguish yeah. between the tension about not having this with matter multiplets and pure this That That's all. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, right, right, right. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, uh, here also, in some sense, you're right. I mean, I, I didn't think of it this way, but you're right that the work that Turok and so on did just if you have this uh, mini super space model, yes. so to speak, yes. I and mean, then everything's fine. So you can have this data. But the moment you turn on, let's say, even tensor perturbations, so something mm. that must be there, mm. uh, you find that there are these inverted Gaussians and these are runaway solutions. So that very little bit of perturbations kind of uh, okay, okay. spoils yeah. your solution. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, that's, that's okay, nice. okay. They're related. Yeah, so. Right.
Yeah, I have a similar question to Alok. So this result of Clurock that you are mentioning is a statement right. about Euclidean quantum gravity no boundary proposal like part integral and uh, and then that's correct. Uh, and, and then and then you show that if you start with such a initial state, it will have some runaway behavior. Is that the statement or that's right? If if, if one that, that, some that, that part, yeah, okay, I see. You start with some, but, but his statement is actually inside. actually. Okay. I, I I can I can go to this uh, well actually I can go to this now and we, we can come back to other things later uh, because and this, this is a statement so also is, about perturbative uh, some semi classical perturbative uh, without as Alok was saying it is without matter it is simply a, a statement no it, it is gravity. without matter but it is not perturbative it, it is it is it is a non perturbative definition of uh, quantum gravity so uh, you know Hartle Hawking is yeah, yeah, is not a perturbative. Right. So the, yeah, yeah. the, but you the approximation, really of course, is that. Anything, uh, uh, I that's correct. Can so you cannot you can anything non perturbatively from there. Right, right. So I mean, you, you're right, and I mean, you see, there's a the thing is that it is a non perturbative definition, but you cannot do the full quantum gravity there. So the what the way, way people have done or done any progress here is that they choose mini super space models. So you just choose like you know FRW. And then you can actually evaluate the path integral, at least in the saddle point approximation. So, so what Turok and people showed is something a little bit more general. And so let me go through this slide now, I don't mind, uh, because we're discussing this already, so which is, you know, the Euclidean path integral is not well behaved uh, for all contours of the labs. So instead, they start with the Lorentzian path integral. So instead of saying that, you know, you have this no boundary to some finite uh, Lorentzian space time at late times, they say that, you know, you have the zero measure, I mean, the, the, the zero uh, metric. Uh, so it's a Lorentzian path integral, which goes from zero to uh, with a degenerate metric at the beginning to, to some finite metric at the end. So this is in some sense what uh, uh, Filinkin was proposing, but he never did the path integral calculation. He was always working in the canonical picture. So Turak and et al. Like, said, like, let's start with Lorentzian path integral. And then the problem with the uh, Lorentzian path integral is obviously it's hopelessly badly behaved. So that's why where they use the picard leftist theory to yield a convergent integral from an oscillatory integral. And what's happening is, you know, the, it's this old problem of uh, gravity having the wrong sign kinetic term. So, I mean, the scale factor you see has a wrong sign kinetic term, or the wrong meaning the opposite sign of the kinetic term compared to, let's say, some uh, tensor perturbation or some scalar field. So that's, that's the essential problem. And that's what leads to some unsuppressed runaway perturbations on the final three geometry. And that's that's why you don't have like De Sitter with a well-behaved bunch Davis state, but instead you just lose your background solution. Uh, well, what we should because okay, we so but, uh, just, but well yeah. okay, okay. So you're probably going to come to that. Yeah. So yeah, I think what I was maybe you're addressing this thing that the mini super space is typically an uncontrolled approximation. Yeah. That's I I, I yeah, okay. That can be one thing, uh, but what what I am addressing here is that the way we fixed it was something else. Like you know, there is this uh, there are these models in loop quantum gravity which allow for dynamical signature change, and if you have that, then this this changes with some function beta, and th this leads to having again like a bunch Davis state at the onset of insertion, and that's what we showed. So th this is just to say, I mean, you, of course, I'm not giving you any details, but just to say that you can have some non Perturbative. So these are certainly non-perturbative quantum gravity corrections that one has from loop quantum gravity, known as this holonomy corrections. And then you end up with, again, a well-defined de Sitter with some bunch Davis state. And this, this idea of signature change, so signature change essentially means that, you know, there's some finite time at which you go from Euclidean to Lorentzian signature in the very early, in the high curvature regime, very early universe, let's say, in the context of cosmology. And, but this idea is more general than look on gravity. It appears in like all sorts of things like CDT uh, and uh, matrix models and other things. So I just refer to a few of these. So generically, it seems that if you have some sort of this kind of signature change, perhaps, well, non-singular signature change, which is what one has in look on gravity, then you would solve this problem that Tiro can tell, point it out. Did, did I, uh, sorry, maybe you can ask your question now. No, no, it's, it's fine. It's fine. No, I, 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 I get it. Okay, so, so, you, okay. so basically, uh, uh, you, you, but, but, okay, maybe a follow-up thing would be to say that what happens uh, in, in string theory would believe that there would be some, uh, some kind of perturbative and the back reaction or whatever of non-perturbative stuff would lead to the signature change. Or... 
Right. So, so in string theory, if you have to really approach this problem in string theory, I would say the best way to do this is to say that the hartle hawking wave function, you can express it as the partition function of some dual field theory. And then that is the way to go about it. And then I, I haven't done any work myself on this, but uh, Thomas Hertog and others have been working on that. And that, then you have a different definition. So you don't have to work with the gravity path integral. You, you can work with this um, you know, CFT or some, some field theory uh, path integral, which is much simpler to do, do which is the dual to the um, hartle hawking proposal. And then in that, anyway, you can I, calculate I, I, a lot of things. But that also yeah. is, has some anyway. problems maybe because, yeah, okay. Of course, of course, yes, of course. I mean, the, the biggest problem is we don't know what is the dual to the you know four-dimensional uh, Einstein gravity, which is what what the Hartle-Hawking wave function is for. So then the first thing you have to do is to go to some you know, higher spin theory or something, at the very least. Um, but yeah, anyway, yeah, there, there's a lot of a lot of these problems. Okay, so let me go back to where I was and try to. So how much how am I doing with time? Ah, uh, you have fifty. Uh, you have actually 17 to 20 minutes here. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. So. So anyway. So I. I think I've given you enough reasons that there are a lot of this. Uh, so the, okay. Let me give you one last reason, which is this QFT in distributed space time. So like, let's now forget quantum gravity even. So these were some general quantum gravity reasons, but let's just look at QFT in distributed space time, and. Again, very from 80s Motola and then Polyakov more recently has been talking about how the sitter state is unstable or the sitter is unstable when coupled to some interacting quantum field theory due to some arbitrariness in the choice of a vacuum and so on. I mean, again, there's a debate about this and uh, people like Suskin would, I think, disagree with the statement, but, but there are some results which says that essentially that, um, well, I'll come to this in a second. And this kind of an argument is also what people found in this transplantian censorship conjecture, which is again, puts an upper bound on the lifetime on the sitter. These are all QFT arguments. And something that I would like to touch on in the 15 or so minutes that I have is if you actually look at inflation and you think about the fact that we have only access to part of the Hilbert space and not everything, because we only have access to certain modes, then we should treat this as an open quantum system. And in this case, we, one can find uh, an associated uh, for Neumann entropy for the system modes. And if one imposes the covariant entropy bound on this von Neumann entanglement entropy, which increases actually with time, one finds a time limit for which this is valid. And that time limit is quite remarkably matches with some of these Swampland, uh, Swampland uh, predictions for, for no reason, because it's a completely QFT calculation. So I'll, I'll try to mostly focus on this for the rest of the talk. Uh, but just to motivate this, how instability of quantum field theory in distributed space times can also lead to some, some ideas like this. So as I was mentioning, you know, what if, uh, what if you have some classical dissider, but then your one loop correction takes you away from it. So let's say we allow for classical dissider, but one loop correction can take you away from it. The only way that doesn't happen is if you choose the bunch Davis vacuum. And then the, the, there is this argument, like how natural is it to assume the bunch Davis? That's like the argument in Polyakov and Suskin. So just to give you the idea in the context of inflation from a, from a cosmologist's point of view is that you see the way that bunch, we, we talk of bunch Davis is that you take a particular mode, you blue shift it backwards in time. I mean, so you go back and you blue shift it. So it becomes very small. When it's very small and inside the horizon, you can totally forget about gravity and pick the unique vacuum for it. And you do this for every mode, so you, the, the vacuum you have is bunch Davis. But the problem is that to do this for every mode, you have to go back to the far infinite in conformal time. Like, because you know, you, I can always give you a mode which is much bigger now. So no matter how much you blue shift, unless you go back to minus infinity, it will never be small enough. But we all agree that there is a particular cutoff when inflation to, should start. I mean, in, because inflation doesn't solve the singularity problem to say the least. So you know, there must be some quantum gravity cutoff, some lambda scale when inflation can start. And if we agree with that, then, then the main argument is that you cannot have a bunch Davis, exact bunch Davis state. Uh, is there a question? Oh, okay, good. Uh, so, so this below this cutoff, so we, we kind of parameterize our ignorance about this pre-inflationary dynamics in this initial state. So one can choose some Bogolibo transform bunch Davis or some one bunch Davis or some other prescription for bunch Davis uh, for choosing the initial state. And the uh, uh, the, and the idea is that no matter what state you choose, if it is not the exact bunch Davis state, then your cosmological constant leaks. What I mean by that is your one loop effective, uh, so your so one loop expectation value for the stress energy tensor does not satisfy a 
it, the same equation of state, so it doesn't satisfy p equals minus rho anymore. So it, essentially you get something like p equals one third rho, so you have radiation, so it leaks as radiation or even matter for some choices of initial states. That's what was shown by Danielson quite recently. I mean, this is well known, but he, he mentioned this in the context of the swamp plan. And even other people have. Well. I am a little bit lost. Why you need a Bogolyubov of transformation yes. of Bunch, Bunch Davies? Uh, no, you, you don't. I mean, it's it's common to choose some something like this as initial. If you don't choose the if you don't choose Bunch Davies, it's common to choose something like this. You can choose something else. You can choose any state you want, as long as it is not Bunch Davies. You will always have this problem. So you you choose this alpha vacuo or whatever you want, as long as it's not Bunch Davies, you will not have the you won't have p equals minus rho anymore. That's that's the main. I was thinking whether you have some kind of condenser in mind or not. That's why you're thinking of Bogolyubov. Uh, hmm. But anyway. No, this was purely phenomenological. Like people usually do this. For, I mean, this is the simplest thing okay. to do, I guess, yeah. for inflation. But yeah. So just a clarification. Okay. So when you yes. say it yes. goes to quant uh, quantum swamp land, I mean, here you are just changing the state, right? So at the swamp land usually yeah. is a statement about the theory, right? I, I totally agree. I, the, the title of this paper by Ulf Danielson was quantum swamp land. So I just, I oh, just kind I of said that, that reason. But yeah, you're absolutely right. So this is just QFT on this. I mean, there's no, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's it. Uh, okay, good. So can I find an upper bound on duration of uh, quantum? So though this is so freedom. This picture, yes, yes, yes. Uh, are there, you know, when you talk about um, uh, non-bunch Davies vacuum, Often, you, earlier in a different context, you mentioned, uh, you know, you chose uh, some uh, states with cutoff so that there is no back reaction and so on. Often, That's there is no uh, will motivate a choice for these non vacuum state, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So it, this is quite obvious uh, what you choose. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There are different choices, but yeah, they're all <laughs> equally good uh, from the classical point of view. That's right. So, so this picture is just to tell you, okay, I have maybe 10 minutes, good. So this picture just tell you that we know, we all know that there is a minimum number of E foldings you require for inflation to explain uh, observations, but is there a maximum number? That's the question. And of course, just from classical again inflation, we know it's not true. I mean, if this, this can be our universe and we can be in a part of a much larger space, inflation could have lasted much longer. So is there an upper bound? That's the question. And the TCC, so I won't go into these details and because I'm running out of time. So let me just show you this picture. So the picture is essentially this. This is Planck scale. So this is Planck length. And the TCC just tells you that if you have a mode, so modes are getting stretched. So this is this blue lines tell you how modes are getting stretched. This is when inflation lasted. So inflation started here, inflation ended here. And this is like standard Big Bang cosmology. So if you have a mode which is this wavelength is, is smaller than Planck length, then it should never be allowed to exit the Hubble horizon. And that gives you an upper bound on inflation. So you start with the Planck's length mode, and then you say it can just not cross the Hubble horizon. That gives you an upper bound. And then you of course know there's a lower bound, which, which is essentially saying that the horizon today must have must have come from within the Hubble horizon. So there is an upper bound coming from this TCC, this sort of quantum gravity argument that maybe there are transplankian modes, but at least it should not come outside the Hubble horizon and classicalize. So they won't become part of our system. That's the argument here. And then there's a lower bound just from observations. So if you combine both of these things, what you find is that you get, and then you, you get an energy scale for inflation, which is very low. I mean, it's allowed, but it's very low. And such a small energy scale would mean, at least for single field inflation, that you have a very small value for the F, for epsilon, and you have a very small value for the tensor to scalar ratio. I mean, this is assuming this this line is assuming single field models. Um, you, you get something like this. So what what came out is, of course, we know if epsilon is very small. The swamp plan tells you that you know v prime over v is large or v double prime over v is large. One of these two things has to be large. And that's kind of nice because already from observations, we know that if epsilon is this small, then eta has to be large. I mean, it has to be order 0.02 or whatever, just from observations of the spectral tilt. So that's good because this is kind of uh, consistent with the swamp plan. That one of these two things have to be large. And then what this tells you that the swamp plan 
favors hilltop kind of models. So you know you have these hilltop models where the eta or the v double prime, the parameter corresponding to v double prime is large somehow, but epsilon is very small. But you see, this is not good news because uh, if R is this small, I mean, if you ever observe tensor to scalar ratio, then all single field models are ruled out. I think that's, that won't make these people very unhappy. At least Robert would be quite happy. He doesn't like inflation, but that would make me unhappy. So I came up with some way to circumvent this. You can always do this. You can have some alternate mechanism for the production of primordial tensor modes. And then you can have that, you know, R is maybe something like this. And yet you will have the TCC satisfied. So I mean, you can play these games, of course, as you know, of course, model builders. But then, even if even if I can do all of these things, a very small epsilon would mean that the you know one of the biggest thing of inflation is an attractor solution. So, but for these low scale models, inflation is not an attractor solution. So you require some very fine tuned initial conditions for these small scale inflation models. And the way we ease that problem, I mean, I convinced Robert that that can be eased and that is to use this Vilenkin's formulation. So again, this is something like the hartle hawking wave function. If you're not familiar with it, it's something very similar to the hartle hawking wave function with some, uh, with some differences, uh, well, some technical differences. But this is some non-perturbative uh, quantum gravity proposal again. And again, I'm just talking of mini superspace plus perturbations when I talk of something like the tunneling wave function. No, no one knows how to do it for full gravity. But that automatically actually, that prefers to be at the top of the hill. That's where you want, that's where you have to be for this kind of models to work. And this automatically explains why you would come out, why you would nucleate to the top of the hill and not the bottom of the hill. Essentially, that's the argument. And then uh, people like Cliff Burgess recently pointed out that, you know, maybe transpankian modes can come out of the Hubble horizon. It's not a problem. They said like, you know, this is not a problem for EFT, ne not necessarily a problem for EFT. They said like, you know, TCC might be true, but it probably is not a problem if evolution is always adiabatic. And we recently showed that actually there are for particular models of inflation, like uh, something like you know, Higgs inflation or something like this, uh, non-adiabatic behavior is actually important for start and end of inflation. So during inflation, you have slow roll, things are adiabatic, but setting up again requires some non-adiabatic conditions, some non-adiabatic behavior. Um, okay, good. So let Can me- Can I ask? Yes, I have a question. Course. What do you mean by non-adiabatic? You mean multiple fields? You mean perturbations are non-adiabatic? Yeah. yeah, in this particular case, I mean that, uh, uh, you know, you cannot have this Coleman-Weinberg approximation anymore. So this is the sense also, I think, in which Cliff Burgess means it. So you cannot write down the effective potential as the Coleman-Weinberg potential. So that's, you don't have some sort of derivative expansion, which is allowed. So you require some additional corrections to the Coleman-Weinberg. Let's just say that, yeah. Okay. So in this sense, it's not adiabatic that your derivative expansion is not allowed, which underlies the Coleman-Weinberg expansion. Okay, so there is some structure also. The TCC is related to the De Sitter conjecture and many other things. Uh, let me quickly tell you that, you know, TCC can be derived, I mean, it, it, it already implies the De Sitter conjecture uh, in, in, again, asymptotic regions and in in other places, actually, the TCC is not only valid in asymptotic regions, other places it allows for de Sitter, but very short lived de Sitter. And then uh, I showed that, you know, you can derive the TCC itself from the distance conjecture and the species bound. So, you know, that lends some, again, some connections between this con some conjectures. The other people have immediately shown that, you know, there are other connections between de Sitter conjecture and the distance conjecture and the TCC and so on. I won't go uh, into but, through uh, all of should these talk, uh, What exactly yeah. uh, tells you the time scale where effective field theory breaks down here from the time? Scale yes, scale right, there. right. So that that's 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 my punchline oh. here. So even if the TCC allows for very short-lived metastable desitter, but the time scale is one over h log of well, I set mass Planck to one, so it's log of one over h. So this mass Planck over h. So this is up to logarithmic corrections one over h. This is much much smaller than any stringy construction that I know of. I, I think there are no stringy constructions which give you something that is compatible with this. So this is bad. But because how, this really how do you is, get this, uh, how, do you, how, how do you get this bound from where? Uh, the bound is just like, you know, the, you, you remember there was an upper bound on the number of e-foldings, right? So this, this is the upper bound on the number of e-foldings. And from there, you can get this bound for the time scale for uh, the decision solution. So the number of e-foldings is for inflation, of course. 
But if you assume exact Jupiter, then this is the time scale that you get. I, I can show you the derivation at the end if, if, if you're interested. Okay. I mean, it's really simple. Yeah. Okay, so let me. Uh, I have five minutes, I guess, or maybe three. I'll take two more and I'll just say something at the very end, uh, which I definitely don't want to completely skip over, which is, so in inflation, it's essential to work with open systems. That's because, you know, for example, only we can only observe the modes which exit the horizon, the Hubble horizon during inflation. And these are quantum fluctuations. So how do they become classical? That requires decoherence. There must be some environment. So if the universe itself is what we are observing, what's the environment? So it must be part of the universe. So whatever we don't observe, let's say the sub-Hubble modes can be, can, can, uh, can work as an environment for decoherence to happen. There's not been a lot of work on this, but some people of course have worked on this. And I, this is not an exhaustive list, but just name some of the people who've worked on open systems for inflation. So what, what it means is that we can't just use Wilsonian usual EFT. That's because in Wilsonian EFT, you can integrate out high energy modes. And if they were not there to begin with, they will not appear at the end. But now, you know, the sub horizon or this uh, high energy so-called UV modes are not excluded by any conservation law because you don't have, you know, you break trans translations now. So the system degrees of freedom can now exchange energy with the environment modes. And this requires some open EFT. Um, to be honest, I don't know why. Some people call it out of equilibrium EFT. I don't know why if there's a difference between the two technically. But for me, open EFT essentially means this, that there is part of the Hilbert space that we have access over and part which we don't, so we have to trace over those. So this necessarily means that, you know, there's some non-unitary evolution because you have only access to part of the Hilbert space. And this builds up some quantum entanglement. So you can measure this with entanglement entropy. So what do I mean by non-unitary? The full theory, so now I'm not talking quantum gravity, nothing like this, it's just pure, simple inflation. So the full theory is of course unitary. So if you work with the full density matrix, everything is unitary evolution. But then you trace out over this environment modes, you have a reduced density matrix, which obeys what is known as this Lindblad equation. So this does not obey just the H with rho, but also there are some Lindblad terms. What these terms denote, uh, these are dissipative so terms. Can I, can I, yes. can I ask something? Yes, yes. So normally yes, in this Limbaugh formalism, there's a clean separation between the environment and the system, right? But, uh, but in your case, uh, that is not also true because uh, you are incorporating transplankian modes over a period of time. So that, that, uh, that's that right. probably, uh, yeah. So then you can still apply this formalism. Yeah, you can still apply it. So for, actually, right now, I'm not worried so much about transplankian because for me, it's the Hubble horizon. So it's just a sub-Hubble modes and super-Hubble modes. I'm assuming that, you know, the transplankian modes are taken care of by some quantum gravity theory. But you're right that what is at one point sub-Hubble will become super-Hubble later on. So that's not very clean. You're absolutely right. And that is what is interesting. That is why you will find some remarkable results. I'll, I'll just show it to you in like one minute. <laughs> so... So these Lindblad terms are these dissipative terms and they denote essentially that, you know, why we don't have unitary evolution because now the system can just dump energy or borrow energy from the environment anytime it wants. And these terms essentially denote that. And they, they have some connection to, you know, um, stochastic inflation formulation, but I don't want to get into those details. So entanglement is necessarily a quantum phenomenon. So this can be a nice smoking gun for the quantum origin of structure. I mean, if inflation is really the theory of the early universe, if we can observe something in the power spectrum or higher statistics about entanglement entropy, that would be very nice. And that's something we, we were working on right now. Anyway, and this is not exclusive to inflation. So any other theory like pyrosis, which also posits quantum fluctuations as the origin of the universe would also possess this. So this is the picture that this is my environment modes and this is my system modes. And I assume that some quantum gravity theory is taking care of this transplankian modes. I'm not bothered about that right now. And so you have some mode which becomes super Hubble after some time. So you're getting stretched outside the horizon as I already mentioned. Okay, I won't go over these details which cosmologists are very familiar with. And if you're not, they're not very important, but this is just to say that, you know, there's the Hamilton, the quadratic Hamiltonian, everything is, everything is unitary because this is the quadratic level, but there's one usual case and something that gives you squeezing. This is not important, but then we would introduce some interaction Hamiltonian, which is a cubic term. So this is the leading order cubic term out of all of these possible terms. So I'm just assuming again, single field, slow roll inflation. So no DBI inflation, no fancy terms and so on. But this kind of interaction term would now lead to uh, some coupling between the modes. So, you know, uh, as opposed to flat space QFT, gravity plays 
different roles now. We have a time-dependent background, so that's that uh, contributes to the squeezing. We have a Hubble horizon, which separates out my system and horizon, uh, system and environment. And this cubic interaction is provided by the non-linearity of GR. So this cubic term is not something I put in by hand or by some specific choice. This has to be there if your low energy theory is GR. So I, I break up my Hilbert space, the system and environment, and I want to calculate entanglement entropy. So again, because I'm completely running out of time, this is, this is just a recap of how one calculates perturbative entanglement entropy between different momentum bands. So this is following this paper by Rand Stonk and Bala Subramanian. Uh, but you know, the results is that you, you calculate entanglement entropy involves some uh, uh, correlation functions that you must, some matrix elements which you need to, cal uh, which you need to evaluate. And then you can calculate, this is a leading order entanglement entropy. Lambda is the interaction parameter. So this is of course, plus higher order terms. This is a perturbative entanglement entropy between momentum bands, so between two momentum bands, which are separated out at let's say some scale mu. Is there a question? Yeah, can I, can I ask a brief question? Uh, there will be K uh, mode mode uh, interaction. Yeah, sure, right. sure. Right, right, right. How do you account for that? And uh, uh, I mean, do you make also make a distinction between sub Hubble and super Hubble scales? Yes, yes. So, so my distinction is just sub Hubble. So the modes, the mode coupling between sub and super Hubbles are going to be the interesting one. So let's say I have K1, K2, K3, and let's say two can be sub Hubble and one can be super Hubble. That is going to be the leading order term that I will find. That's the, that's the one which is going to contribute here. Of course, K and minus K also, also have coupling, as you mentioned, uh, but that that I won't include here. That's known as the squeezing entropy, which people had calculated earlier. So that is not part of this. I mean, that's like a sort of leading order effect. I, I will I will just show you the, my final slides essentially. And you I can understand. See you that kind of thing. Yeah, thank you. So we just did this calculation now for inflation. Of course, you have to generalize it because for key of T in Minkowski, this is like, you know, lambda is time independent. So you use time independent perturbation theory and so on. Now you need time dependent perturbation theory because this lambda depends on time. There's a scale factor here. And um, there's no well defined notion of the energy squeeze state. So the environment, I mean, the system modes are now in the squeeze state, whereas the environment mode are in this bunch Davis vacuum. So that's like the quantum vacuum of flat space, but this is, in, this is something else. So one can calculate the entanglement entropy, some, some things change, but, and this is the leading order term as I just mentioned, but let's just look at the final result. So the entanglement entropy per unit physical volume goes something like this. So it's proportional to the slow roll parameter to H square, the Hubble of inflation. I assume that you know Hubble is constant during inflation and so on. And to the mass Planck, which is the UV cutoff and to the amount of inflation that one has. That's the interesting part. And the reason why this is proportional to the amount of inflation one has is because as was already pointed out, some of the sub Hubble modes are becoming super Hubble over time. So that's leading to this kind of a secular dependence. More and more sub Hubble modes are becoming super Hubble. Your entanglement entropy is increasing with time. It's not, it's not something that's constant. So as was just asked by Sri Ram, like you know, there is also an entropy which is proportional to k minus k. That's in the squeezing entropy. People had calculated long ago, and what one finds is that you know, typically, typically, quadratic effects are always bigger than cubic effects in quantum field theory. But in this case, because the entanglement entropy is increasing with time if n is not fine-tuned to be very small, the cubic entropy, the entanglement entropy that I'm pointing out, the leading order entanglement entropy, at some point will win over this squeezing entropy, which is the quadratic entropy, because that's k and minus k. That's just coming for the quadratic part of the Hamiltonian. This is quite remarkable, but this is something we expected because Jean Martin and Vincent, Vincent, Vincent Venon showed that for the context of decoherence, there's a bigger effect to the bi tri-spectrum than the bispectrum. So, you know, some, in some sense, they also found something similar earlier on, not for the context of entanglement entropy, but in a different context. And what is new and what I definitely wanted to mention before I, uh, well, I'm, I'm over time, but what I definitely wanted to mention before I finish is very recently in this paper, I tried to just say that if the entanglement entropy is increasing with time, what happens if I impose the covariant entropy bound to this? And one finds a bound on the number of e-folds, which is very close to TCC. Remember, TCC is n is less than log of mass Planck over h. This is not quite that, but this is very close. Where do I get all these numbers? I've used the, I've used the observed value of the power spectrum. So that's where some of these numerical numbers are coming in from to eliminate for epsilon. So this is very close to TCC. 
And just to just to emphasize this, you know, growth of entropy often leads to very deep puzzles in physics, as we know from black hole physics and so on. But right now, what the the uh, the point of view that I am taking is that this growth of entanglement entropy uh, should never surpass the background Gibbons Hawking entropy. I mean, that should never happen because there's only finite amount of entropy that can be there in the causal patch of the sitter, or quasi the sitter in this case. And if I require that, that means that inflation can only take place for a certain amount of time. So, uh, by the way, but this result, uh, this covariant bound is a quantum gravity result, right? So, you're not taking into account gravitational contribution to the entropy, entanglement entropy. No, this, this is purely uh, gravitation, right? Because this is just the uh, cubic nonlinearities, uh, which is giving you this uh, cubic term. So the entanglement, so, so the uh, covariant entropy bound. No, what I mean is that there is any the way, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm a bit confused about you. it. Because, but you see, yeah, there is some... no, no, you, 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 you're the... right. So the covariant entropy bound is for any entropy within your causal patch of the sitter, right? So now if I have some field theory and I have somehow I'm producing more particles or whatever I'm doing is producing a lot of more entropy that should never upset the background. I mean, then I don't have decitor space at that point anymore. If, if I believe that decitor space is finite entropy, that's the covariant entropy bound. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, well, we you can are, probably prefer this. You're talking about entropy associated with the perturbations, right? And there is always an that's entropy correct. associated with the decitor. Now you need to compare which that's is correct. dominant. That's good. So D sitter is obviously dominant to begin with. That, exactly, that's my point. So the perturbation, perturbative entropy is very, very small to begin with. But you see, if something grows secularly with time, I mean, if you wait long enough, it will overpass, it will overcome the background entropy. So that's my point that, you know, this is a, the perturbative result is of course small, but that's small to begin with. And then I let it increase. I mean, it's not up to me, but it is increasing, I see. So at some point, whenever this is, you know, comparative, I mean, this is becoming bigger than the background entropy. I said, no, this is it. You can't have more inflation than this. That's precisely what I'm talking about. So, yeah, okay. So that's, that's it. So the point is that, you know, there is no, this is just a calculation of entanglement and perturbative entanglement entropy uh, on quantum field theory, but in decitor space, a quasi decitor space in this case. And I apply the covariant entropy bound. So ju just to give you a comparison, when Vafa et al. found the Decider entropy from the distance conjecture. What they said was that you know in this asymptotic limits on this asymptotic parts of moduli space, the distance conjecture tells us that there's a lot of new states, not a lot of new massless states which descend from the UV. Because there's a lot of states, new states coming from the UV, there must be a lot more entropy now. And because the entropy is increasing, it can only increase up to whatever the Gibbons Hawking entropy is. And using this bound, they found the Decider conjecture. So in some sense, that of course has a stringy input that the distance conjecture tells you that there must be this Kaluza kind modes or the winding modes, and that gives you a lot of more entropy. What I'm saying is I'm not doing any of that. I'm just doing an EF, EFT calculation of entanglement entropy because I know that I have access only to part of the space, the cause of that. And then if this entropy is increasing, then at some point this must overcome the given talking entropy. So nothing spectacular here. What's, what's remarkable and what I didn't expect is that the result you get looks so close to what TCC gives you. That's, that's kind of the unexpected part. That because this is a purely you know, PFT calculation, why, why are you getting something that looks very close? I mean, for example, we could have gotten the, you know, the e to the power s or something like this much larger uh, time scale, but that's not what you get. You get log of s. So that's, that's the crucial. Uh, I mean, I don't know why that happens, but that's the finding here. Okay, so I, I have completely run over time. So let me finish here with this, this with these conclusions that you know this is interesting. The swamp plane is interesting, but and it's expanding. There's a lot of bouncing models in loop quantum gravity, which we have been trying to rule out for some time now. And very recently, we've even found that you know for specific black holes, so this is not something specific to cosmology. Even black holes, we found specific black hole solutions, in particular for loop quantum gravity, can be ruled out from the black hole shadow that has been seen. So that's nice that you can rule out some fundamental or you can constrain fundamental uh, parameter space of uh, quantum gravity theory just from observations. And I didn't get time, sorry, to talk about uh, De Sitter as a coherent state in string theory, but I think you've heard Keshav at some point or another about this. And we worked out how that can, that can happen. We're still working out other aspects of it. How can one find inflation as a coherent state is something that we want to figure out. And what early results are showing us that this kind of a formulation of using FRW or some inflation in space-time as coherent state 
uh, rules out violating non-energy conditions. So that would then rule out bouncing solutions because that necessarily violates non-energy condition uh, in string theory. So that would be quite exciting if you can do that. But the way this is ruled out is just from considerations that from EFT considerations. So that's quite, I mean, we're not using any non-energy conditions, it's just coming out of our formulation. Anyway, there's a lot more work to be done in the swampland. And one thing which I definitely want to mention is right now we are we're writing up a paper with Robert and Samuel, who's a student here, about the IKKT model. So their inflation is not the only game in town. There are alternatives. One particular nice alternative is the IKKT matrix model, which is conjectured to be a non-perturbative description of type 2B string theory. And we, have, we started with this. We're trying to get some cosmology out of this model. And what we are finding that not only we will get some non-singular early universe cosmology, it can give you scale invariant power spectrum for the scalar modes and the tensor modes, and yet have some very distinct predictions which are different from inflation. So for example, in what the, what the tilt of the scalar modes are and so on. So that's something that is forthcoming, hopefully, hopefully by the end of the summer. Thanks, thanks for your attention and very sorry for running over time. Thanks, Shuddo, for this very nice, interesting talk. Uh, it was, there was, was a lot of material and it was uh, quite, yeah. Thanks for putting all that in. So any question? Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Of course. Uh, so though, uh, the, can yes, I go yes, back to that uh, entropy you calculated using the third order action? Yes, yes. So uh, what's the summary that it is growing um, right. uh, as, uh, okay. That's, that's a, yeah, I can... I'm not, a, what, what does the number imply? Um, so what it implies is that you see, uh, so the, you know, th there's this, this is where the e to the part two n is coming in from, right? So, um, the point is that why, why is this coming in? That, that's, that's like a good question, I guess. Uh, maybe if I explain that, that, that would answer some of the questions. That's because let, let's calculate something like, so what, what we want to calculate so for this kind of entanglement entropy for momentum bands, one calculates matrix elements, which look like this. Now, if you were doing this in flat space QFT, you would have like the flat, I mean, the usual quantum vacuum on both sides, the fog vacuum, right? So if you have a fog vacuum on both sides and you calculate something for CC dagger, that's essentially just one up to some delta function. But now, because you have the squeeze state, you get some cinch factor, some squeezing parameter in here. So that's, that's leading to some remarkable differences. That's why you have this growing part of the entanglement entropy. So to begin with, as you see, this, this quantity is a perturbative quantity. It's very small. It's not only suppressed by epsilon, but it's also like suppressed by you know, H, essentially. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a small quantity, much, much smaller uh, than the background entropy, which is mass Planck square over H square, much, much larger than this. But uh, then it becomes large because if you wait long enough, it will become large. Okay, it's, it's, it's the squeezing which amplifies that. Is that correct? No, so, so the squeezing is where some of this time dependence is coming in from, but the, what the reason, the physical reason behind this is, is essentially this question that Ayan was asking. Like, I mean, you, you see, your system is such that there is not a clean separation between system and environment modes. Your, there are environment modes, more and more environment modes are becoming part of your system with time. So that's leading to an increase in the entanglement entry. And, and that term, that term you have arrived at will go away if you ignore the third order action. That's purely due to the yes, third order yes. action. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that, yeah, so here, what I have here as the third order action, I mean, I write it with some lambda, but I mean, this lambda is essentially coming from that term. So I take away the third order action. I have no coupling between between the modes. I mean, between you know the sub and super Hubble modes, except for k and minus k, and all of this goes away. I mean, of course, the squeezing entropy will still be there. And the squeezing entropy, I didn't show you the result for that, but this was known from, I guess, 90s. And that quantity is something which also one can calculate, but, um, but that's, that's a constant. I mean, this doesn't increase with time or anything. So again, to begin with, the squeezing entropy is bigger than the entanglement entropy, but again, you wait long enough, it overpasses, it's, it overcomes that. Okay, thank you.
Okay, so uh, I think we had many questions already. Uh, so uh, let's you. then uh, have a nice you know, more, have a nice day. And it was good to meet you and Thanks. visit us in Chennai some point whenever you are in India. And uh, yes, yes, of course, of course, I'd love to. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, okay, very nice yeah. Uh, yeah, same here. Okay, all the best for the for your move to Edinburgh and. Uh, and, Thanks. and for uh, stay safe and hope to see you again. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, bye.